welcome. Welcome, everyone. Who is here for the first time? I love that. Wonderful. Welcome. So this is the Science of Cooking public lecture series, and we do this every Monday at 7. And very soon, I'm about to introduce Sander Katz, who is going to talk to us about all things fermentation. But first, I just want to put this into context. So who was here last week? Wonderful. So for those of you who are new, you know that we're playing a little game every week. Yeah? Do you know? So if you paid very careful attention to what happened last week when Chef Lydia Bastianich was here, you have the chance to win prizes. And in order to do that, you have to answer a question. The prize is these aprons, which I'm going to try to do with one hand. Aprons with equations. So, so we, we clap for equations. So, so the question is, uh, so, so Lydia made risotto, and she said it's very important to make risotto in a wide saucepan rather than in a deep saucepan. Why is that? Yes. Ah, the increased area of the saucepan in, allows all the grains to cook evenly. Anything else you may want to add? Yeah, good. There's more area for, for liquid to evaporate. Okay, next question. As Chef Lydia slowly cooked the rice for the risotto, a component that contributes to the creamy base of the risotto was pulled out of the rice and into the sauce. What is the name of this component and what kind of macromolecule is it? That's two questions. But you get an apron. Anyone? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you know the name of the specific starch? Anyone? Yeah. Amylopectin. Okay, I think this one is easier. So Chef Lydia claims that it is very important that the stock is hot. So she had a pot of risotto, and then she had a stock which she was adding to the risotto, just one ladle at a time. And she claimed that it's very important that this stock is also kept hot. It can't be at room temperature. Is it true that it has to be hot? Okay, anyone, raise your hand. <laughs> yes. It is, it is important. <laughs> I, I could have asked you to, sh to show me why. Here is, so if you were here, you remember the equation of the week, which was this. And if you were, if you were a student in this class on your homework, which is actually due tomorrow, so please don't spread the word, um, you would have calculated how much this affects the temperature of the stock. So if you add early in the cooking process, you add one ladle of stock to, you don't have to pay attention to this, your final, your, the final temperature after you've added a ladle of stock to your risotto is 72 degrees Celsius. If you do it early in the cooking process, if you do it late in the cooking process, it's about 82. So yes, adding that ladle of stock actually does bring the temperature down by like 20 or 10 degrees, which you could imagine is enough to, to actually not really keep the risotto at the right temperature. So these equations are useful sometimes. Okay, so, so that's it for, for aprons. So last week, we cooked with heat. We did something, I mean, Lydia ad added all kinds of things to, to uh, water, but basically what she did from a scientist standpoint was she added grains to water and then she added heat. And then she waited. That was basically it. This week, we're gonna cook with microbes. So you would think sort of at, at first, first glance that these are kind of opposite ways to cook. You, most of you know that adding heat to food is what sanitizes food, it's what kills microbes. And when we cook with microbes, as Sandra will tell us, you really want to make sure that you keep those microbes not just surviving, 
but happy, thriving, dividing, doing their thing. So they add flavor, preserve the food, do their thing. So, so that's kind of our goal for, for, this, for today. Um, and the reason for this is that microbes are basically bags of enzymes. Enzymes are basically proteins. Usually when we cook food, we mess with proteins, right? If you cook a steak, you're messing with the proteins. If you're whipping the egg white, egg white, you're actually messing with the proteins. If you are cooking an egg, you're denaturing the proteins, you're messing with the proteins. Now, if you messed with the proteins inside these cute little yeast, you would be messing with all of these enzymes and the yeast would die. So you don't wanna do that. Okay, so um, they may seem opposite, but they have actually a lot in common. So one of the things that cooking with heat and cooking with microbes have in common is it's something humans have been doing for millennia. So this is, the, I guess, the, the most current um, number for how long we've been doing this is um, fish found in, in Sweden, actually. Um, that is 7,000 7, BC, so 9,000 years old. That's our early, some of our earliest evidence. Our second earliest evidence is similarly about 7,000 um, BC is beer, ancient beer recipes in China. So this is something how humans have manipulated foods in this way for way, way, way back. The other thing that cooking with heat and cooking with microbes have in common is that they're really simple recipes. I mean, cooking pasta. You add pasta, water, heat, done. Here is sauerkraut. Add sauerkraut, a little salt, thyme, wait, wait. But then you're done, eventually you're done. So simple, really simple recipes. You know, often when we think of cooking, we think of these complex things, you add this, you do this, it's very complex, you have to have a lot of skill and training. Not, not necessarily that hard. The other thing that cooking with heat and cooking with microbes have in common is they break down large molecules. So the large molecules of food, the proteins, the carbohydrates, the fats, you break those down when you cook, say, a steak. So the delicious molecules on top of a brown steak, it's due to the breaking down of the proteins. And similarly, um, when you ferment, say, milk, you're basically breaking down the long carbohydrates in the milk, adding lots of microbes, and over time, you're getting these beautiful flavors. But they come from that milk. They come from the long, big molecules. It's the breaking down of them that does this, like, creates this beautiful new flavor. So, very quickly. So, microbes are good at what they do because they divide really fast. And I like this, I usually do this. So, if you have one bacteria, it divides and makes two bacteria. Then they die, the first one dies, and, and each of these create two new ones, blah, blah, blah. They keep doing this, and over time, you get something like this. So, good, good, good. So, so you can put all this together in an equation. The equation looks like this, and, and it basically says that if this much time elapsed, and if the time of a generation is this long, so time, the time of a human generation is like 30 years, um, microbes, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, an hour, two hours, um, you plug it in, you can basically find out how many there will be after X, after a certain amount of time. So I thought we should do an experiment, do a little calculation. So question number seven, this is an old homework problem. E. coli divide every 20 minutes. If the spinach you had for dinner at six, that's an hour ago, um, and there was one bacteria on it, how many extra E. coli do you currently have in your body now at seven? And how many do you have tomorrow morning at 9 a.m.? So you can do your exponentials in your head. I'm sure you're good at that. Uh, but I can also just show you. So <laughs> after an hour, so two, after an hour we have 60 minutes, the time per generation is 20 minutes. So now you have about eight E. coli in your stomach. That's okay. Tomorrow morning, it's about 15 hours later, an hour is 60 minutes, over 20 minutes, lots and lots, 10 to the 13. And if every E. coli weighs 10 to the negative 10 grams, that means you would have three kilograms of E. coli 
in your belly tomorrow morning. That's a lot. That's, that's why exponentials are amazing. They, 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 you produce a lot of microbes. Is that true? Is that going to happen? Yes or no? Why? Stomach acid? The early generations die. They run out of nutrients. Yes, exactly. In order for them to divide and build that biomass, they would have to eat stuff in your stomach. And so they would have to eat of you. So they run, they run out of nutrients and they can't divide that much. You'll still have some E. coli and you'll still may get sick, but maybe not as sick. Okay, so things to think about as we go into this lecture. So it is a great honor for me, huge honor for me, to introduce Sander Katz. Sander Katz is one of the great fermentation experts of our time. And um, we go way back by like two years because Sander <laughs> has Skyped into my classes and talked to my students for years. And so it's super exciting for me and many of, of, of the people on the staff to finally have him here. So please welcome Sander Katz. All right, well, thank you. Can, can everybody hear? Okay, great. Um, no more equations. Um, <laughs> so, okay, what, what, what I want to start with is just addressing the question, what is fermentation anyway? Um, but first, I want to do a little poll. How many people here uh, would say that they have uh, uh, eaten or drunk something fermented uh, in the course of this day? Okay, I'm seeing a lot of hands, maybe most hands, but I would bet that most of the people who didn't raise their hands actually have eaten something fermented already today. Um, you know, almost every individual in almost every part of the world eats and drinks products of fermentation every day. Um, so, um, you know, if you're here in uh, uh, Cambridge and, you know, sort of eating a, a standard American diet, you know, maybe you had some coffee this morning. Coffee is fermented. Maybe you ate some bread. Bread is fermented. Maybe you had some cheese on that bread. Cheese is fermented. Maybe you had salami or some other kind of cured meat on that bread, which is fermented. Maybe you had a salad with salad dressing that included vinegar, which is uh, uh, fermented. Maybe you ate some chocolate, which is fermented. Maybe you ate something with vanilla in it, which is fermented. Um, but, you know, an, an incredibly diverse range of everyday foods and beverages are products of fermentation. And what is it that unites all of these disparate foods? Um, they're all produced by the transformative action of microorganisms. Um, and from a food and beverage perspective, that's how I would define fermentation. It's the transformative action of microorganisms. Now, I imagine we have some biologists in the house, and the biologists are already shaking their heads. Um, because for a biologist, fermentation means something a little bit different than that, something that's both more specific uh, uh, and also a little bit broader. Um, for a biologist, fermentation describes um, anaerobic metabolism, the production of energy without oxygen. Um, and, you know, in fact, the cells of our bodies are capable of fermentation. I mean, mostly we operate uh, um, uh, with respiration, and the most efficient way that our cells produce energy is with oxygen. And we have this elaborate system to distribute oxygen to, to each of the cells of our bodies. But if we exert ourselves in ways that sort of demand energy beyond what that oxygen can facilitate, um, then our cells revert to this fermentative mode of energy production. Um, which is less efficient, it produces this byproduct of lactic acid, which uh, can be responsible for giving us that feeling of a muscle burn when we exert ourselves. Um, now, how does this relate to these foods and beverages? Most of the foods and beverages that we describe as fermented um, meet the biologist's definition. They are anaerobic. You know, to, when we turn you know, this bowl of um, uh, cabbage and other vegetables uh, uh, into sauerkraut, that's an anaerobic process that does not require oxygen. When we take milk and 
fermented into yogurt, that's an anaerobic process that does not require oxygen. When we take um, you know, grape juice and ferment it into wine, that's an anaerobic process that does not require oxygen. The, the reason why, why I typically depart from the biologist's definition of fermentation is that there are a large handful of microbially transformed foods and beverages that do require oxygen. So, um, you know, like if any of you like to drink kombucha, a kombucha is an example of an aerobic ferment. Um, you know, call it an oxymoronic ferment. Um, you know, because it's a microbial transformation that requires oxygen, but like everybody thinks of it as fermented. Similarly, vinegar requires oxygen. Um, similarly, many types of cheese require oxygen. Um, the Indonesian soy ferment tofu, uh, I'm sorry, tempeh re requires uh, uh, oxygen. So, you know, because there are all of these microbially transformed foods that, um, you know, don't meet the biologist's definition of fermentation, I like to work with this broader lay definition that fermentation is the transformative action of microorganisms. However, not every transformative action of microorganisms results in something delicious that we're ready to put into our mouths. Um, and, uh, you know, for most people, our, our, our primary um, awareness of the microbial transformation of food comes, you know, when we clean the refrigerator. Um, and, you know, in the deep recesses of the refrigerator, you know, you find decomposed vegetables and, you know, things that have begun to mold. And, um, man, yeah, that's also the transformative action of microorganisms, but we don't call that fermented. We have a different vocabulary to describe that. We call that rotten. We call that spoiled. And we reserve the word fermentation to describe intentional uh, or desirable microbial transformations. Um, but I think the fact that we all inevitably you know, experience um, you know, food decomposition maybe can give us some insight into the inevitability of microbial transformation of our food. Now, I mean, in terms of science and cooking, um, you know, one of the things that's most fascinating to me about fermentation is that you know, people have been practicing this for you know, 10,000 years, I would argue longer, that, you know, the, 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 that what the archeological record really is, is finding is it's telling us about the history of pottery. Um, and that that's when pottery emerged, and that the earlier vessels were all biodegradable, so we're not finding remains of them. Um, but, but anyway, you know, that's, uh, who, who knows? Um, um, but the people who figured out fermentation techniques, they didn't have the benefit of microbiology. They didn't know about microorganisms. Um, and, you know, what we now understand is that you know, all of the plants and all of the animal products that make up our food are populated by these elaborate communities of microorganisms. So, you know, the question is, are these microorganisms going to, you know, decompose our food into something disgusting that nobody would ever put into their mouths? Are these microorganisms going to, um, uh, you know, create toxic byproducts or, or, or make us sick? Or are these microorganisms going to somehow elevate the food? and make it you know, more delicious, more stable, more digestible, um, you know, or, or, or improve the food in some way. And without knowing about the existence of microorganisms, people in every part of the world figured out you know, through observation, through trial and error, through happy accidents, who knows how they figured it out. Um, you know, how to guide the microbial transformation of the food. And really what the practice of fermentation amounts to are manipulations of environmental conditions that determine, you know, which of the multitude of organisms that are present on anything that makes up our food are going to develop and, and in what way they will be transformed. So, you know, a head of cabbage. Um, yeah, I mean, here, I mean, I'll, I'll be referring to this repeatedly through the evening, but if we just left a bowl of cabbage like this sitting on the counter for two weeks or two months, it is not going to turn itself into sauerkraut. 
Uh, and it's really quite predictable what's going to happen. And, you know, some of us have seen the early stages of this. Like, maybe you had a piece of cabbage like this left over from something you, you, you cooked. And, um, you know, let's just say there was no room in, in your fermentation slowing device, your, your refrigerator, and you left it on the counter. Um, and you didn't get back to it the next day, and it sat there for a few days. Has anyone ever seen, like, a little film... Of, of mold develop on those cut surfaces. And you can still use the cabbage, you just slice those away, but, but you know, where, where the carbohydrates are oozing out in the presence of oxygen, mold is going to grow. So, um, so you know, it's possible to have a bowl of cabbage turn into like, you know, a cloud, oh, here, now I can see where it's, uh, okay. Um, <laughs> Um, uh, you know, it's possible to have a bowl of shredded cabbage turn into, you know, like kind of a cloud of mold that could literally reduce that, that cabbage, you know, into a, a puddle of slime that bears no resemblance to delicious, tangy, crunchy sauerkraut. Um, you know, also, I mean, not to scare anyone about eating cabbages or other um, uh, 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 raw vegetables, but, you know, the, the, the bacteria that produces... Uh, you know, the, 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 the scariest uh, food poisoning pathogen that, that we know of, Clostridium botulinum, which produces a toxin called botulism. Um, it's such a common soil bacteria that probably none of us have ever eaten a vegetable in our lives that didn't have cells of Clostridium botulinum. But we really only ever hear about botulism in the context of canning. So if you, um, you know, if, you, if you sterilize food in a jar in order to preserve it, but you fail to use adequate heat, it, uh, Clostridium botulinum can survive high, higher than boiling temperatures. So, um, what, so what, what, what you do is you sort of kill everything else and leave that as the sole survivor in the very contrived environment where it can thrive, which is a totally oxygen, um, uh, in the total absence of, of oxygen. It's an obligate anaerobe. It can only function in the absence of oxygen. And we don't really spend much of our time in a totally anaerobic environment. So, you know, when, 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 you, when you chop up cabbage to make a, a coleslaw or to ferment into sauerkraut or to make a stir fry, you don't have to worry about the botulism. It's only if you sort of put it in that specific environment where it can grow. So there's a lot of potential ways that a cabbage or a glass of milk or a glass of grape juice or, you know, anything that we could eat, uh, there's a lot of different ways that it can microbially transform. And, you know, which of the microbes that are on it are going to develop is entirely a, 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 an environmental uh, a question. And so fermentation is all about manipulating environments to, um, you know, encourage the growth of certain kinds of organisms while simultaneously discouraging the growth of other kinds of organisms. So, I mean, what we'll be doing eventually with this bowl of, of cabbage is we're going to get the vegetables submerged under their own juices, and that just protects them from the free flow of oxygen so the molds can't grow. It's not totally anaerobic. I mean, there's dissolved oxygen in the water, so the Clostridium botulinum can't grow. And in that sort of protected environment, the lactic acid bacteria, which are um, you know, generally believed to be present on all plants growing out of soil on planet Earth, they can thrive and, and flourish. And as they acidify the environment, they kill off most of the other organisms that are present. Um, and, and that's really what, or that, that's part of what enables the food to be so um, um, effectively uh, preserved. Um, so fermentation is the transformative action of microorganisms. There is no food that cannot be fermented. I mean, it doesn't mean every food has, you know, equally prominent traditions of fermentation. Um, you know, a couple, you know, avocados are like an example of a, of a food that, like, I don't think that there's much tradition of fermenting. But I've put avocado in sauerkraut. It works great. Um, and, um, you know, that, like, nothing that we could possibly eat could not be fermented. Um, and then, you know, a, a related issue is fermentation is practiced everywhere. I definitely do not possess encyclopedic knowledge of culinary traditions, uh, you know, everywhere in the world. But I've been looking really hard for counterexamples for, you know, more than 20 years. And I can't, every time someone has proposed, like, a, a part of the world where um, uh, uh, they believe that fermentation is not practiced, I've been able to, you know, learn about a fermented food or, or beverage from that part of the world. So... You know, I, I think it would be conceptually possible for hunter-gatherer people to 
live without fermentation. Like if you're going to spend each day procuring the food resources that are going to get you through that day, you don't really have to think too much about um, the dynamics of how food fares over time. But you know, as 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 people in different parts of the world transitioned from um, you know hunter gatherer societies into agricultural societies, if you're going to invest your energy. Uh, and your resources into crops that are ready at a certain moment of the year, then that is only um, feasible as a strategy for survival if you have some strategies in mind for how you're going to um, uh, you know, preserve the harvest to get you through the rest of the year. Um, so, uh, you know, I would argue that, that agriculture itself would not be possible without fermentation. And it's not that fermentation is the only uh, uh, ancient method of, of, of preservation, but, um, you know, most of the ways that we preserve food today, you know, just, just did, haven't existed in the past. I mean, okay, you know, we can't even imagine how you live without a refrigerator. And if we were sitting here just 100 years ago, you know, nobody would have a refrigerator. And, um, you know, bear in mind that most households on planet Earth in 2017 do not have a refrigerator. Refrigeration is not universally available. Um, and so, you know, people use other techniques for um, uh, uh, preserving food. Um, you know, then we might think about canning. You know, some of us might have, uh, you know, think of canning as an old-time preservation technique because, you know, we mostly associate with a grandparent or great-grandparent or something like that. Um, canning is a 200-year-old technology. It was, it was uh, patented in France in 1812, uh, where it's called apertization because they remember the name of Nicolas Apert, the clever Frenchman who, um, you know, invented the process of sterilizing food in, in a jar. So if you take away refrigerators and freezers and canning, there aren't that many other methods of preservation. There's drying food, uh, drying food preserves food, um, you know, basically by depriving the microorganisms that are on the food of the water that they need in order to function. So, um, you know, dried foods are not, you know, sterilized in the way that canned foods are. Um, the microbes are, 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 are present, um, but they're in a state of dormancy because they lack the water that they need in order to function. And, you know, certain foods are just um, dry when they're mature. That's, that's their nature, like... Um, uh, you know, any kind of grain, any kind of bean, any kind of nut, um, you know, they're, they're just dry when they're mature. Other foods can be dried, like um, uh, fish or meat or fruit or, or vegetables. Um, you know, really any food could, could be dried. Um, and then beyond that, fermentation has been, you know, just a major way that people have preserved food. Um, you know, sauerkraut, kimchi, pickles, um, you know, these are all strategies for people in temperate parts of the world to preserve vegetables from, you know, the, the limited season when they can be grown to get people through the rest of the year. Um, cheese, you know, we mostly think about cheese as a, you know, sort of as something that's tasty and, you know, something that you walk into a gourmet store and there's all these different choices and, um, um, you know, exciting flavors and textures and all that. But, I, I mean, you know, really what cheese is, is preserved milk. Uh, um, you know, cheese and yogurt um, and kefir and other forms of fermented milk really are strategies for extending the life of this or the, you know, the usefulness of this, you know, extremely perishable food. Um, salami, you know, you walk into a delicatessen and the salami is just like hanging from a string in the ceiling. I mean, that's, you know, that's preserved meat. It's a, you know, you, you take this, you know, this animal that, you know, you've been feeding for months and, you know, weighs 300 pounds and you can't eat it all at one sitting. So you have to have strategies to preserve the meat so you can eat it uh, um, um, over a longer period of time. And that's what all cured meats are. So, so preservation has been just an incredibly, incredibly important reason why people ferment. Um, you know, I wish I could say that I got interested in fermentation for something uh, as high-minded as that, but, you know, what first made me start thinking about fermentation was the flavors of fermentation, and fermentation creates compelling flavors. And, you know, if you walk into a gourmet food store anywhere, most of what you're going to see and smell are products of fermentation. 
Um, and, you know, most of the world's, you know, greatest delicacies are products of fermentation. Um, and fermentation creates strong flavors. Of course, with strong flavors, not everybody loves every flavor of fermentation. And I think, um, you know, cheese illustrates this so well. Um, so, you know, as my taste has evolved, and I wasn't born like this, but like I love stinky, stinky cheese. And, you know, if I can smell it from, you know, hundreds of feet away, it just it catches my attention and, I, and I'm dying to, to try it. And I'm, I'm so sure not everyone in here would share my passion for stinky cheeses. And, you know, whenever I, whenever I have a really sort of very ripe, stinky piece of cheese and I invite some friends over to share it with me, you know, inevitably somebody gets to the door and just makes this awful face and they're, and they're thinking, did something die in here? And like they would never ever think about putting something that smelled like that into their mouths. And you know, the world of fermentation is just full of these, you know, strong flavor. You know, they're what we would call acquired taste. Like you're not born loving um, a, a, a stinky cheese. You're not born loving uh, sour strumming, the, you know, Swedish low salt fermented herring. Um, um, you know, just the, the stronger flavors of fermentation people learn to like through, through exposure, through seeing other people get excited about them, um, through being willing to taste them a second and a, and, and a third time. Um, so, so I, I mean, flavors of, of, of a very important aspect of, 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 of fermentation. Um, what's getting a lot of people interested in fermentation at the present moment is perceived health benefits. So I want to just address that a little bit. Um, you know, it's not like all of these foods have precisely the same qualities. You know, it's not like, you know, coffee and bread and cheese and kimchi, uh, you know, are all the same. Like, they're, they're, they're all different. They're all based on different foods that have different qualities. Um, the fermentations are different. You know, every food is unique. But the process of fermentation transforms nutrients in some very clear patterns of ways. Um, you know, the first way uh, uh, Pia referred to uh, uh, in her introduction, and that is what I would call pre-digestion, and the idea that, you know, while the food is fermenting, you know, the bacteria or the fungi that are fermenting it are breaking down nutrients into, um, you know, more elemental forms, and frequently these simpler forms are easier for us to access. I would say that the most dramatic example of this is soybeans. You know, the reason why the vegetarian, soy, uh, the vegetarian subcultures of the West became so interested in soybeans and they became, you know, almost a singular replacement for meat and milk is that soybeans are considered to be the plant food with the most concentrated protein. But you really never hear about people just, you know, eating a plate of soybeans for dinner the way they might with, you know, lentils or chickpeas. Um, and, you know, the reason for this is that our human digestive systems are not capable of breaking down the protein in soybeans. And, um, you know, it won't kill you if you eat a plate of soybeans for dinner, but it'll make you really gassy, it'll give you terrible indigestion, and you're not going to get the protein out of the soybeans. Um, and so, you know, somehow thousands of years ago, the Asian cultures that pioneered soy agriculture recognized the indigestibility of the soybeans and figured out how to make soybeans digestible. Um, and, you know, we have this whole range of fermented soy foods. There's soy sauce, there's miso, there's tempeh, there's natto, there's, uh, you know, really like dozens of other variations. Um, you know, the, the, the four that I mentioned are very different in flavor, they're different in texture, they're different in fermentation processes, they're different in the organisms that ferment them. But what they all have in common is that that protein gets broken down into amino acids, the building blocks of proteins. Um, similarly, um, when you ferment milk, lactose, the milk sugar that so many people have a hard time digesting, breaks down. And many people who can't drink a glass of milk have a fine time eating yogurt. But of course, you know, it's not a question of yes or no, it's a matter of degree. And, you know, most commercial yogurt that's available, I mean, the assumption, at least in the United States, is that people, you know, want their yogurt minimally sour. Um, and so, you know, most commercial yogurt in the United States is fermented for about two and a half hours, which is enough um, uh, uh, to just set the yogurt, but without making it too sour. But, 
what the sourness is, is lactic acid, and that's what the lactose is being transformed into. So the more sour it is, the less lactose there is. So you can, if you make yogurt yourself at home, instead of fermenting it for two and a half hours, you can ferment it for eight hours. You can ferment it for 12 hours. You can ferment it for 24 hours, and you'll have a, a different product. It'll be more sour, but there will be less lactose to it. That's pre-digestion. Even gluten, the you know, notorious uh, 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 wheat protein um, uh, uh, that so many people have a hard time digesting can be broken down by fermentation, not by yeast, but by bacteria. And um, so, you know, yeast that you can go to, you can go to any store and buy, um, you know, yeast has been, has been present with us, um, um, you know, for, for, forever. Um, and people have been making bread for, you know, something like 10,000 years. Um, and, and using yeast. But until Louis Pasteur isolated yeast in the 19th century, yeast was never alone. Yeast has always been used with the bacteria that it travels with. So, you know, on the wheat itself, like on grapes or on barley, um, you know, the yeast is there, but it's not alone. It's with lactic acid bacteria. So what we now call sourdough which is natural leavening, which is really how bread for the first 9,900 years was made, um, it, you know, the, 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 the fermentation included not only yeast, but bacteria. And those bacteria can break down gluten. So there's a much lower level of gluten in, in bacterially fermented bread or bread made with a natural leavening or, or a mixed culture. And this, this question of mixed cultures is really you know, kind of essential because until the emergence of the science of microbiology, um, like there was no such thing as singular microorganisms. Microorganisms are everywhere, um, but they're never alone. They always exist in communities and in, and in, and in pretty elaborate communities. And, um, you know, we've all been reading a lot about, you know, the human microbiome over the last uh, a, a couple of decades. And, and, and more and more is known and understood about that. And, you know, each of us uh, uh, is host to, uh, you know, something like a trillion bacteria, many more bacteria than we have human cells with our own uh, uh, unique DNA. Um, and, um, you know, and the, I mean, the carrot and the cabbage also have a microbiome. You know, every living thing uh, 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 has, has, has a microbiome, has, has its sort of symbionts that, 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 that they live with. Um, but there are always these elaborate communities. It's, it's never one singular microorganism. Um, Predigestion. Okay, I, I got off on a little tangent. Um, <laughs> Um, a flip side about, of predigestion is instead of breaking down, um, in addition to breaking down nutritious compounds, um, fermentation can break down toxic compounds. So there's all kinds of um, uh, uh, toxic compounds uh, uh, um, in, in different kinds of plants that fermentation can break down. And some of them are dramatic, like cyanide in cassava. You know, cassava in certain parts of the world grows with these extraordinarily high levels of, of, of cyanide. And if people were to eat unprocessed um, cassava roots, um, you know, they would literally kill them. Um, and yet it's this, you know, very important source of nutrients for about a billion people around the, the, the equatorial regions of the world. And so in the parts of the world where cassava grows with high levels of cyanide, um, one of the major strategies for removing the cyanide is fermenting it. And it's very simple. Like you peel it, you coarsely chop it, put it in a, in a vessel filled with water uh, that initiates a fermentation and it breaks down the cyanide compounds into benign forms. A lot of food toxins are not quite as dramatic as that. Oxalic acid found in a lot of uh, uh, vegetables uh, uh, breaks down uh, by fermentation. Um, uh, phytic acid, which is found in the outer layers of, uh, of seed foods, breaks down through fermentation. There's even some evidence uh, uh, showing that um, residues of organophosphate pesticides can be broken down through, through fermentation. So all kinds of toxic compounds in foods can be broken down by fermentation. Then, you know, another interesting aspect that's really just um, beginning to be uh, um, investigated are the metabolic byproducts of fermentation. And a lot of them are turning out to have, uh, you know, interesting 
um, therapeutic uh, 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 potential. So for instance, in sauerkraut and other fermented vegetables, there are these compounds called isothiocyanates, which are regarded as anti-carcinogenic. Um, and you know, they're not found in the vegetables you begin with. They're generated by the lactic acid bacteria over the course of the, of the fermentation. Natto, the Japanese soy ferment that's never really caught on in our part of the world because it's, it's got a slimy texture um, um, and it's an example of, a, of an alkaline ferment. So it sort of smells a little bit like ammonia. Um, I know, I know I'm, I'm, I'm making it sound very appealing, but it's actually incredibly delicious. And in that slimy coating that develops on the, on the soybeans is this compound called natokinase. And you could go into any vitamin supplement store in North America and buy natokinase that's been extracted from natto because so many people are taking it because it's been found to dissolve fibrin. Fibrin is, you know, when you hear about people with clogged arteries, um, you know, that, the, the, the fibers that build up inside of our blood vessels, um, that, that's fibrin. And, and, and this compound that's a metabolic byproduct of bacillus subtilis as it ferments soybeans, um, you know, actually can, can break, break uh, 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 that fiber down. And, and so a lot of people are taking it in therapeutic ways. Um, then finally, what I would consider to be the, you know, the greatest potential benefit of, of fermentation would be the bacteria themselves. Um, so, um, you know, I talked a little bit about the microbiome. I mean, you know, all of us, you know, older people here who, you know, sort of grew up through the 20th century, like, you know, we were brainwashed with this idea that bacteria are our enemies. Bacteria need to be avoided. And when they are encountered, bacteria need to be uh, uh, destroyed by any means necessary. And, um, you know, science is actually telling a much more nuanced story this, this, these days. Um, you know, bacteria are the matrix of, of all life. Uh, there's an emerging consensus in evolutionary biology that all life is descended from bacteria. The flip side of this is that no multicellular form of life lives without bacteria. And just as, you know, we're dependent on these trillion microorganisms that are part of us, you know, so too is the cabbage and, and the carrot and, um, you know, and the cow and the pig. Um, and, you know, really everything... You know, everything we eat has its own uh, microbiome. And yet we're still in this war on bacteria mentality. Uh, and we all have chemical exposure um, to compounds that are designed to kill bacteria. Um, you know, whether it's antibiotic drugs, whether it's antibacterial cleansing products, whether it's the chlorine that's on all of our municipal water systems. But, you know, we all have exposure every day to these compounds that are designed to kill bacteria. And luckily, none of them kill all bacteria. Um, but what they do is they diminish biodiversity. And, and, you know, we think a lot about biodiversity in terms of, you know, the oceans and the rainforest. But biodiversity is a, is a concept that, you know, applies inside our bodies as well. Um, and... Um, you know, as we learn about the, you know, incredible range of our functionality that involves bacteria, um, you know, we're also learning ways in which, you know, we are hurting ourselves through this chemical exposure that diminishes our biodiversity. Um, so, I, I mean, bacteria in our bodies, you know, do way more than enable us to digest food. I mean, that's a very important thing, that bacteria enable us to effectively digest food and assimilate nutrients from that food. Um, what we call our immune systems are, are largely the work of, of bacteria in our intestines. In the last few years, there's been incredible groundbreaking work demonstrating that um, uh, serotonin, and other uh, uh, compounds that determine our neurological function, how we think, how we feel, um, are regulated by bacteria in our intestines. Uh, and it turns out that you know, nearly every process in our bodies um, involves these bacteria, and yet we continue killing them off. Um, and so this has given rise to what is called probiotics. It's like you know, the antidote to antibiotics, to ingest bacteria. Um, and, you know, there's a huge industry of, uh, you know, little capsules that you can buy, probiotics. Um, and, you know, each of those capsules is saying, oh, this is, you know, a billion cells in this little capsule. Well, it's a billion copies of, you know, one or two or three different bacteria, which has, you know, limited impact on biodiversity. Um, the contrast to that would be 
traditional fermented foods, none of which involve singular bacteria. They all involve these uh, elaborate communities of bacteria. And so we, when we ingest living fermented foods, I mean, we are, we are you know, promoting biodiversity in our uh, uh, gut. And we don't fully understand it at all. I mean, there's some elaborate, there are elaborate interactions between the bacteria we ingest and the bacteria in residence or in our intestines. The, you know, earliest uh, articulations of the idea of probiotics, uh, Eli Mechnikoff, uh, um, you know, writing 110 years ago, you know, I mean, his, his vision of it was you eat the yogurt and the bacteria of the yogurt just take over the intestine and make everything better. And, you know, it's a highly competitive environment in there. You know, um, um, you know it's, not like the, it's not like the bacteria in residence in our intestines just sort of move over and make room for, you know, the new bacteria in the yogurt to, to take up residence. But there is an elaborate interaction and part of that interaction is a genetic interaction and you know one of the most fascinating things about bacteria is their genetic flexibility so in contrast to us and animals and plants and fungi you know which all have you know fixed bacteria for I'm sorry fixed genetics for the course of our lives um, Bacteria aren't constrained in that way. Bacteria are extremely genetically flexible. They can exchange genetic information. They can pick up genetic information from the environment. They can get rid of genetic information that's no longer relevant to their existence. Um, and so, um, you know, part of that interaction is a genetic uh, 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 interaction. Um, you know, all of that said, I think that, you know, fermented foods are, 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 are very important. I think there's also a lot of unsubstantiated hype. Um, you know, there are, you know, websites telling people that if they drink kombucha every day, their diabetes will go away, your hair will never get gray, um, you'll reverse aging. I mean, there's a lot of ridiculous things that, are, that people are saying. But, I mean, I think that the, you know, the underlying idea that there is great potential when we ingest bacterially rich food to improve digestion, improve immune function, um, potentially improve mental health and, and other systems of the body without any risk, um, you know, is, is, is uh, 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 significant. Okay, now let me talk a little bit about some fermentation concepts. So, the first book that I wrote about fermentation, my books are up there, I'm gonna do a little book signing after, was called Wild Fermentation. I didn't make up this expression. It's found throughout the literature and it describes something specific. Wild fermentation is fermentation that is based on the organisms that are present on the food. Like nobody, well, I won't say nobody, uses starters to make sauerkraut because people are selling starters to make sauerkraut. But, you know, it's, I mean, it's totally unnecessary. Um, it, you know, lactic acid bacteria are present on all plants. Like there's no reason to add a starter because you'll find the bacteria you need on all plants. Um, you know, you don't really need, a, you don't need yeast to make wine either. I mean, nobody had yeast to make wine, um, you know, until Louis Pasteur did his work. I mean, you know, you, 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 you crush the, 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 the grapes, the, the, back, the, the, the yeast and bacteria are on the skins of the grapes. They initiate the fermentation um, uh, and they, you know, transform the sugars into alcohol. And then if you don't protect it from oxygen, other bacteria that are there will transform the alcohol into acetic acid. But anyway, that's wild fermentation. It's just sort of basing your fermentation on the organisms that are spontaneously present. The contrasting style of fermentation, no less wonderful, is when you introduce some sort of a starter. Um, there's basically three different categories of starters, I would say. Um, you know, I referenced the packet of yeast. Um, you know, that's something that Louis Pasteur and the, um, uh, you know, emerging science of microbiology made possible. Isolating singular microorganisms. Yeast is the most common one. Um, you know, if you wanted to make, um, you know, Camembert cheese here in Cambridge, um, you know, it was, uh, you know, initially it was done as a wild fermentation with raw milk in a certain cave system in France. Um, but, you know, if you could simulate the, um, uh, you know, temperature and humidity conditions of those caves, you could go on the internet and you could buy the right bacteria and the right fungus and, um, you know, sort of follow procedures that have been outlined and you could sort of simulate the conditions of the caves of France and you could produce camembert cheese in your apartment in Cambridge. Um, you know, I make koji, which, I, which is a 
Japanese um, um, rice with a fungus grown on it that's the starter for making soy sauce, for making miso, for making sake, for making amazake, many other foods. Um, um, and so, you know, I, I buy imported from Japan a, a, a fungal starter to make um, a, a, a my koji. Um, but what's important to understand about these singular microorganisms is they are sort of brand new in the scheme of things. They're, you know, 20th century technology of isolating organisms um, and an incredible range of starters are available, but they're, but they're new in the scheme of things. The ancient form of a starter is um, uh, what I would describe as backslopping. Um, and that's basically you take the old batch and you put some into the new batch. This is how people make yogurt. You know, the way you make yogurt is you save a little bit of the old batch and you put it into the, a fresh batch of milk and there's some temperature manipulation involved in there too, but the source of the bacteria is typically the last batch of yogurt. This is what a sourdough is. I mean, you, you generally a sourdough is started as a wild fermentation because really all of those yeasts and bacteria are present on the yeast, uh, on, 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 I'm sorry, on the, on the wheat or on any other grain. But, um, but once you have a nice vigorous sourdough with a good flavor and a, and, and, and a good lifting action for your bread, you never bake the whole thing. You always save a little bit to perpetuate it, to introduce into some fresh uh, uh, um, uh, uh, flour and water. Um, and I mean, I've met people who have sourdoughs that are hundreds of years old, that like, you know, that, that's been passed down in their families for, uh, for, for, for generations. Um, and you can do lots of things this way. I mean, um, uh, you know, before pure yeast was available, a lot of breweries made beer by always saving a little bit of the last batch to introduce into the next batch. Uh, this is the way a lot of traditional salami making has been done, save a little bit of the old batch to introduce into the next batch. So that's really the, the, the ancient form of a starter. So, um, and, then, and then the third form of a starter are what we would describe generically as SCOBYs, S-C-O-B-Y, which is an acronym which stands for Symbiotic Communities of Bacteria and Yeast. And so, um, you know, there's really just a handful of these. The most uh, uh, famous example right now would be kombucha. Uh, the, the SCOBY is the mother of kombucha. It looks like a rubbery pancake and it floats on top of the uh, sweetened tea. Uh, and, and that community of organisms that are, that are part of the rubbery pancake grow into the sweet tea and digest carbohydrates and, and transform it into uh, 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 kombucha. Another example of this would be kefir, um, grains of kefir, very different appearance from kombucha. They look more like little florets of cauliflower and embedded in those florets of cauliflower is an incredibly complex community with um, uh, more than 30 distinct uh, uh, organisms that have been identified that somehow coordinate their reproduction, spin this skin that they share, um, you know, and ferment milk uh, uh, in the process. There's a handful of other ones. There's one called tibicos, also known as water kefir, uh, which comes from Mexico and, and uh, looks more like little crystalline structures. And you put them in, uh, you know, any kind of carbohydrate rich liquid and they'll ferment the carbohydrates into acids and a little bit of alcohol, and you can make delicious uh, uh, beverages with them. Now, I mean, conceptually, all of these starters had to start as a wild fermentation, right? I mean, where did the first yogurt come from? I mean, it's a little bit of a chicken or an egg uh, 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 problem, but I mean, you know, I mean, in my mind, it's very clear that like, you know, it was a, a happy accident on, in, a, in, in some very warm place on a hot day and somebody sort of realized that the temperature had something to do with it and figured out a technique for, um, you know, through backslopping, reproducing their um, uh, uh, results. Um, but the questions of origins are, you know, with, with, with anything and certainly with any of these foods is, is you know, very, very murky and highly speculative. And there's, there's a huge literature that sort of like addresses the question, you know, how did, how did humans, you know, discover or invent fermentation? And I mean, my perspective is totally that humans didn't invent or discover fermentation, that, um, you know, we evolved already knowing it. Um, you know, there's a lot of like there, there's a lot of great documentation of um, you know different kinds of animals gorging themselves on fermented fruit, um, you know, including primates. Um, oh, and it just so happens that we evolved with enzymes that can digest alcohol. Interesting. Um, so, uh, you know, I mean, humans didn't invent alcohol. I mean, alcohol is a natural phenomenon. Like, you know, if you ever pick a lot of berries, you'll note some of them are fermented. 
Um, and, uh, you know, it's just a natural phenomenon that, you know, our clever ancestors figured out, uh, uh, you know, how to make happen. Um, um, and, and we developed a lot of technology, like I, I, I referred to pottery earlier, but we developed lots of technology to, you know, enable ourselves to, 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 to sort of, you know, master techniques for, for making these foods and beverages. Okay, uh, let me just talk about the, the cabbage a little bit, and then we're going to um, uh, uh, leave some time for questions, which hopefully there are some. So, okay, this is, um, this is cabbage, uh, uh, some, some um, green cabbage, some red cabbage, some carrots, some onions. Sauerkraut does not just have to be sauerkraut. I like, like, it doesn't have to just be cabbage. Like, really, literally, you could ferment any vegetable uh, uh, you want. We could, like, you know, we could, you know, cut, uh, uh, cut the kernels off of an ear of corn into here. You know, we could put okra in here. Um, you know, like any vegetable you want, you, you, you could put in here. I lightly salted them. Um, I, well, okay, for the sauerkraut method, the dry salting method, y you have to chop up the vegetables. If you want to leave the vegetables whole, then you need to mix up a, a brine solution and ferment it in the brine solution. But when you shred your vegetables, then you can have a more concentrated flavor because you're not diluting the flavor with water. Um, but remember, at the beginning, I said that, you know, our, our objective here is to get the vegetables submerged under liquid. So we have to get some juice out of the vegetables. And so earlier, when we, when we shredded the vegetables, we lightly salted them. Um, lightly salted them because, you know, it's, it's easier to add salt than it is to subtract salt. So, you know, at some point I'll taste it and I'll evaluate, like, do it, does it need more salt? What I'm doing right now is I'm squeezing the vegetables. I'm massaging the vegetables. Um, and really what I'm doing is I'm breaking down cell walls to release juice. Um, uh, you know, in larger scale production, you know, like, you know, fa families or villages that would like, you know, get together in northern Europe and make big barrels of, of, of sauerkraut, they weren't usually doing it like this. You know, they had some kind of a big, blunt, heavy tool and they were smashing down on the vegetables. Or a story here over and over again from, you know, generally people my age or older who grew up in Eastern Europe is memories of having their feet scrubbed and being put inside the barrel. Um, so that they'd have their kids jump up and down. But, it, you know, whether you're going to jump up and down or smash it with a heavy tool or on a small scale do this and just squeeze it with your hands, you're doing the same thing. You're breaking down cell walls. Oh, okay. Um, and you're releasing juices. Um, I'm going to keep doing this for a couple more minutes while I talk about some other, uh, other issues. Okay. First of all, let's talk about salt. Um, a lot of people imagine sour sauerkraut has to be extremely salty. Sauerkraut definitely does not have to be extremely salty. I'm going to add a little bit more salt. <laughs> but I mean, I'm just doing that. that, that that's, just, that's just a taste. Like, you know, if we had like five different versions, one and a half a percent salt, one percent salt, one and a half percent salt, two percent salt, two and a half percent salt, we, would, we wouldn't all agree about which one tasted the best. I mean, we would like, you know, we would probably have people in, in thinking each one of them tasted the best. And, you know, like if, if you follow a recipe in The Joy of Cooking, which, by the way, is where I first learned how to make sauerkraut, um, if you follow a recipe for lentil soup, it will never tell you how much salt to add. Um, you know, it'll say salt to taste. And, you know, people imagine that, you know, that, 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 that fermentation is somehow, like, requires more precision than that. That, like, you know, that you need a scale to weigh your salt. Um, I mean, if you're going to have a commercial business and you want to make a consistent product, then you need a scale to weigh your salt so that, you, so that it tastes consistent. But if you're just making it for your own uh, uh, personal pleasure at home, there's no need to, 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 um, to measure the salt. Um, the reason why... Many of us have the idea that it needs to be very salty, is that this was a survival food. Like, if these were the last vegetables we were going to see for the next six months, you know, we have an incentive to use more salt. If, on the other hand, we're, we're trying to make something that, you know, we're going to enjoy eating, that's going to support our uh, uh, continued good health, then 
there's just no reason to make it extremely salty. I mean, I get emails every week from people who say like, oh, um, you know, I really, want, I really want to eat sauerkraut, but my doctor told me I can't eat heavily salty foods. It does not need to be heavily salty. This is not rocket science. It doesn't need to be a precise uh, 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 proportion of salt. In fact, you can make it with no salt at all. I mean, it doesn't taste very good, and it has, a, it has a really soft texture. The salt does very helpful things. So the first thing the salt does is it starts to pull juice out of the vegetables, osmosis. Um, the second thing that salt does is what makes vegetables crispy are pectins, and salt hardens the pectins. So it makes the vegetables crispier. The third thing is if you ferment vegetables for a long time or in a warm environment or... Certain vegetables, mostly watery summer vegetables like cucumbers and um, zucchini, like they'll get very soft very quickly when you ferment them. What makes the vegetables soft, and it'll happen with sauerkraut too if you do it for a long time or in a warm environment, what makes the vegetables get soft are a class of enzymes called pectinase enzymes that break down the pectins, and salt slows down the pectinase enzymes. Um, it also slows down the lactic acid bacteria. And when your objective is preservation, slowing down the process is actually very helpful. Um, so salt does all these wonderful things, but you don't need a lot of salt. So, okay, I, I squeeze the vegetables until, okay. okay. Oh, I, you can't really get it on the camera. What if I go, no, okay. Oh, oh. <laughs> okay, yeah. Okay, but so can you see that when, I, when, I, when, I'm, when I'm squeezing the vegetables, it's like, a, it's like a wet sponge and all this juice is coming out? That's when you know that it's juicy enough to get the vegetables submerged. Um, you could measure the salt, like the, the, you know, the generic uh, um, uh, uh, proportion that, that is repeated over and over again in the literature is 2% salt. Uh, by weight, but you know you don't need to just 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 lightly salted. It's always easier to add salt than it is to subtract salt. As for vessel, a glass you know glass is perfect. A jar, wide mouth is a little bit easier to deal with than something with a narrower neck. But you could do it in a mayonnaise jar, and and it would be totally fine. Um, you know, you can use ceramic crocks, uh, you can use wooden barrels, you can use plastic buckets. Um, the material you really want to avoid is metal because we're using salt as we cultivate bacteria that are producing acids. <laughs> and, um, and both salt and acids can corrode metal. And while stainless steel theoretically uh, uh, resists corrosion, it turns out that household grade stainless steel uh, just has a thin coating that's stainless and, um, and it eventually will, anywhere where it gets scratched, it'll, it'll start to uh, corrode. Um, you know, then the million dollar question in fermentation is how long do you ferment it? And there, there's just, there's no, there's no straightforward answer to that question. The acids accumulate over time. You know, as a survival food, you know, people in a temperate environment might make this in September, October, November, depending on where, where, where they live, um, and, um, and keep eating it through the next spring when there's fresh vegetables. It doesn't mean you have to wait for six months to eat it. Um, you know, it means it's still good after six months, um, particularly if you have a, a nice, cool place where you can store it. So you just fill the jar, then fill it some more. You don't want to fill it to the very, very top because it's going to um, produce carbon dioxide and expand a little bit, and we don't want it to all spill out. You can see as I press down, the juice is rising up. And then I, I chopped up too much. It takes about two pounds of vegetables to fill a quart-sized jar, um, a kilo for a liter. Okay, so now the vegetables are submerged under liquid. There'll be more liquid tomorrow. No matter how much liquid there is, the vegetables are going to want to flow to the top like our bodies in the ocean. So what I like to do is, I mean, there's all kinds of gadgets people are making. Um, somebody just gave me pickle pebbles that are like these little glass discs that go in the jar and hold everything down. Um, a ceramicist friend of mine made me some little, um, you know, ceramic discs that do the same thing. But, you know, the good old fashioned um, improvisational method is to take one of the outer leaves of the cabbage that has a strong spine, use that almost like a, like a spring, stuff it in, get the little spine stuck under the, 
shoulders of the jar and let it hold everything down. And then if it peaks up, it can be sort of sacrificial. Um, I say sacrificial because, um, you know, we're protecting it from oxygen and there's a surface. There's a place where it's meeting the oxygen. There are all kinds of clever um, uh, uh, vessel designs that uh, are engineered to protect the surface from oxygen. But, um, okay, how many people here have ever fermented vegetables? How many of you have ever had any funky surface growth develop? Oh, look, it's the same people. Um, <laughs> So, I mean, this is the vulnerable place is the surface. That's where your protected environment meets the oxygen. And where the oxygen is, all these other forms of life can develop, most prominently molds. Um, so, so the funky surface growth can be a, um, um, you know, a, a combination of yeasts and molds. Almost always the molds are white molds um, that, that, that will get darker as they mature and sporulate. Um, I don't want anyone to go home uh, uh, thinking they heard me say it's okay to eat any kind of mold, um, but um, because there are, there are definitely molds that are extremely, extremely toxic, um, and you definitely don't want to touch any like bright colored mold, but you know, molds that start out white and stay in a monochromatic range are generally regarded as safe. Everybody scrapes them off the top, remove any discolored or softened vegetables near the top, and what's underneath it is fine. Um, and, um, uh, you know, this is sort of like repeated throughout the literature. And I mean, just the fact that I've been doing this for 15 years and like never had anybody say like, I followed your advice. And then my, you know, friend with extreme mold sensitivities had a reaction. It just makes me feel increasingly confident that they're totally, totally harmless. Um, and, um, um, you know, just everybody who does this has this experience and, and, and it's not a problem. Um, okay, I could go on and on and maybe I will, but... Um... But how about we thank, thank you all of you for coming and thank you, Sander. Thank you.